Hello and welcome to the Business Extra podcast. We're at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos. I'm Mustafa Al Rawi, the Nationals Assistant, Assistant Editor in Chief. With me is Mina Al Arabi, the Nationals Editor in Chief. Hi, Mina. Hi, Mustafa. It's good to have you here. It's fun to be doing this from um, the Congress Center at Davos. It is. You can, you can see the action behind us. Um, before we get into all the issues and topics that are happening this week, a note to our hosts, uh, the forum. Of course, they have their own podcasts. Uh, Radio Davos and Meet the Leader. You can find those wherever you get your audio content. And if you like this show, please subscribe or hit that bell. So Mina, you've been following quite a few of the sessions mm -hmm. and the speeches. I mean, what's caught your, your, your attention? Well, this week feels different for a number of reasons. Many people have written about this, the fact that it's happening in May, not January. So it's not the beginning of the year. It's halfway through the year. It, of course, also is coming after weeks of the Ukraine war. So many of the sessions are framed by that reality. And I think the fact that we're in Europe this is the first time you have war raging in Europe for many years, um, not too far from here. Somebody was, was saying, you know, just a few thousand kilometers away, there's, there's, you know, war. And there's also the reality that the pandemic's not over. So you have major countries like China who are not present here because their COVID-19 restrictions continue. So the sessions are, you go into a session with all of that already there before you've even had the conversation. Um, but the sessions that have caught my eye really are, have been the ones about trust and the need to rebuild societal trust after the pandemic, what people are thinking, what the future of work will be like. So there's been a lot of conversation from people from different parts of the world, completely different industries, but grappling with the same issues. And for a business-focused audience that might be looking at the World Economic Forum annual meeting and, and wondering, what are, what are the things that I should be thinking of when I'm right. planning my strategies, when I'm planning on making decisions? And so there, obviously people are discussing the risks. And one of the things you were writing about was, was energy, mm -hmm. was, was a, big, a big risk that's come up here. The point of risk is a really good one because I think that's what everyone's thinking is. What do I need to mitigate against? Because it feels like there's a lot more to be had in terms of the energy crisis, inflation, uh, supply chain issues, and then the longer term risks was, of course, uh, well, probably immediate and longer term climate change. And that all ties into the energy dynamic. And it was really interesting because yesterday, uh, you know, we had um, the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, give a main address, of course, via video conference because he can't be here. And while everybody, you know, was talking about the geopolitical dynamic, every single conversation I had after that was about what, what does this mean for energy? What does it mean for Russia? And so the energy dynamic is also interesting because, of course, there's the Gulf countries and the oil producing countries. Um, there are key producers that are not present, but Saudi Arabia and the UAE are very much present. And of course, you've also had the Emir of Qatar here. So Qatar, UAE and Saudi are very, very present this week. And it was really interesting hearing them speak because you had the Saudi uh, Minister of Finance, Hamad al actually saying to the Europeans, you can't go back to burning fuel. We need to keep focused on climate risks. And it was, it was such a stark moment to be sitting in a public session where you're having somebody from the Middle East region saying to the Europeans, like, you can't throw everything to the wind just because you're panicking about energy. We have to find longer term solutions. Well, I mean, this is because the, the Europeans have left them in a situation where it's not easy to find alternatives to Russian gas. So they're looking at coal, they're looking at kind of reversing a little bit of their trajectory right. that we, we kind of thought we were on forever, I guess, after COP26. But the, I, I think what you're saying is fascinating because you have the oil and gas producers here their message at COP26 and after was, we agree, we're on board for net zero. We're going to take our part, but don't think the energy transition is going to be easy. Right. Don't think it isn't going to be bumpy. And don't think you're not going to need hydrocarbons. So, I mean, it, it's almost as if, um, you know, coal is an easier political discussion than saying oil, for example, or gas it's or true. nuclear even. And nuclear, it's been really interesting. I've heard no one talk about nuclear here, um, except for you know the fear of nuclear war if things went really sour um, between Russia and Ukraine. And so that's an interesting point, that what are the options um, and energy sources? There has been talk about um, blue hydrogen. So technology is another big topic in Davos as it is every year. And this year, there's a talk about, okay, what investments do we need? What technology do we need? 
um, to get it forward. And again, these are conversations that we're had in COP26 and previous to that, but this year it feels like it's much more tangible and companies are talking about real solutions, but also where's the investing coming from? So I think, you know, one of the conversations I was having yesterday was focused on um, that there is a lot of liquidity. I mean, we're talking about, you know, there's a crisis, there's a crunch in people's pockets, there's, there's fear about inflation, but actually there's a lot of money also around. And it's for those banks to think about how they're investing. Another point I heard, which is not directly related to energy, but related to the states of the world's economy, is the rise of interest rates. And a, somebody quite prominent from the financial sector yesterday was saying that actually for much of the last two or three decades, uh, major economies had been used to lower interest rates. And now mm -hmm. we're on a trajectory where you're going to get higher interest rates. So the business leaders that are gathered here haven't actually worked in that sort of dynamic. And what does it mean for their type of decision-making leadership and so forth? Yeah, and, and there's a lot of criticism um, in terms of what they're doing in the US with interest rates. Um, the, there's an argument that they're going to derail um, economic growth that has obviously been robust since we can, came out of the pandemic. Um, but also, um, we, there's so, so much fluidity when it comes to events. The, if the Ukraine conflict does find a solution sooner rather than later, then the dynamic all changes again. The picture changes again. Right. We're almost here and saying, well, we've got to look at all the different scenarios that could play out and be ready for everything, which not everyone can be. It's true. But you know what's, what's been fascinating is actually you're not hearing much from the Europeans and the Americans that the Ukraine war and the relationship with Russia could change in the near future. And it seems, and this is quite worrying, actually, because it doesn't seem that anybody wants to talk about how do you get to a solution? What does the future look like that may include Russia? There is no real appetite here, which is understandable. I mean, given how stark the situation currently is, but no one's really having that sort of conversation in terms of what does that option look like? Um, I will say, though, that this week so far, it's only been a couple of days um, in the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. There's been a real sense that learnings have to be taken away. Um, whether from the Ukraine war, whether from the pandemic, I hope that stays because sometimes you get that moment when people say we have to change how we do things and it fleetingly goes away. We'll have to see if it this time, no, there are some very serious changes. And as you said, energy is probably the paramount one. And it's also the most exciting in terms of the opportunity. Yes. And, and other, other trends that are going on, you've been uh, hearing about technology yes. as well. And, and obviously there's been a lot of conversation here about Web 3.0 and metaverse. But I wonder if what's the attitude to kind of technology here in terms of regulation and other and other discussions? You know, on regulation, everybody you speak to says it's too late. We've left this way too late. Um, and so they're trying to play catch up. There have been some uh, fascinating conversations about AI in the public sphere, data collection. We've all given up our data to everybody, our health records to come here. You had to send in all your details, for example. And so there is a sense that there's a technology section of advancement and, and jobs and economic growth, but then there's the very big conversation about data and regulating data and personal data and so forth. So those are really important. Um, Meta, uh, the formerly named Facebook company, is, is here in full force. Mm. Um, Nick Clegg, the former uh, deputy prime minister of the UK, who's now their, I think, VP for you know, government relations, is here meeting with all the different um, uh, officials and so forth. And, and they're really trying to say, we can help shape the future of work using our technology, but also the future of interaction. And the irony is here that they're really selling this idea of virtual space, the metaverse, how we can be together. The reality is everyone's really excited to be here in person and wants to do this person, you know, face-to-face -face interaction. There's a bit of that, but um, the future of work and how technology will shape that is quite interesting. They have um, one of the nice things about Davos is, of course, you can do all these demos. So they had a demo of their latest VR headset that replaced Oculus, which is I think, called Quest or, or something like that, Meta's Quest. And they have um, this thing where we could be sitting in a, in a meeting and I can actually press a button and it changes as though I've changed my seat. So I see you from a different angle. Oh, wow. And, and the, the, the VR headset is the strongest I've ever used. And I've been, I've been trying these out for a few years, again, thanks to the World Economic Forum where they have all this technology. And if you look at your hands, your hands are part of the avatar. So as you're talking, and we can actually high five. And if we okay. high five, I can actually feel you. Even if you're sitting, you know, halfway across the world, we feel the sense of high five. 
which is very bizarre. And it's not you feel it in your hand, it's in it's your head. It's psychological. Wow. Yeah, no, that, that is really interesting because I think after the experience of the pandemic, we all were grateful for tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams, et cetera, but we could see that it wasn't quite there. Right, and they can see that too. Yeah. So they're building on that. So this idea that the experience has to be 3D, not 2D, and how do you do that? And so there's been a lot of talk about that technology and, and using that not only in workspace and, and interaction, but for medicine, um, for education. So those conversations are quite interesting here and, and you'll start to see the adoption of some of those probably in two or three years. Yeah, and, and uh, if we move on to, to kind of the economic outlook, there were discussions yesterday, there was global economic outlook. U.S. economic outlook, but I think the one, the session we were both at, which I thought was fascinating, was the Middle East and North Africa economic outlook. We had the Bahrain finance minister, the Saudi finance minister, um, Investcor executive chairman, Mohammed Al-Avi, Majid al Fatame, CEO, Alain Bajani. So you had private sector, f uh, investor, investor, and then you had government. Right. And they were, they were painting a picture of, obviously, the Gulf economy is shining at the moment for a number of reasons, high oil prices, but also great reforms and unevenness across the region, um, but also inflation across the board might not be as bad right. in the Middle East, North Africa, as it might be elsewhere in the world. So generally positive, but a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, I mean, you, you highlighted all the key points from the session. One is the fact that we really had the Gulf on stage, but there was, there's not much strong presence from the rest of the Middle East, North Africa um, region, which shows you the state of, you know, concern about their economies. Um, but they spoke actually generally about it. And it was really interesting to hear that one of the opportunities that uh, both the ministers of finance for Saudi Arabia and Bahrain was lay in technology. And they said they see that in technology, but also in young people and creativity, so the creative industries. And they made a really good point. And the, the, the Saudi foreign minister, uh, sorry, the Saudi finance minister made this point that yes, higher oil prices are really helpful, of course, but they have done reforms and they're almost masking what they had yeah, done in like terms that. of reforms. And he's like, okay, yes, high oil prices, of course, but you know, we have done reforms and that's true. And that's true across the, you know, UAE, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf, really. I mean, uh, it, 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 it was a, it was a good point to make. And I hope the people in the room and those who watch the session, um, online actually appreciate that reality. Yeah. And Alan Bajani of, of, of MAF was, was talking about how, um, he really, he really wants the region to feel like a more homogenous region economically. Yeah. And, and that would be a great opportunity. And, and he, he said something that was quite um, emotive um, in, in the middle of all that discussion, which was that we owe the 600 million people across North Africa and Middle East all the way to Pakistan to really deliver what they deserve and to meet what they need in terms of economic opportunity. And so I, I think we, what we can see is there are, there are actors out there that are working towards more economic opportunity. But he, he's, he said that they're putting out a report today that's going to show that per capita in the Middle East, North Africa, people uh, produce half the GDP of the global average. So, I mean, on the one hand, it's depressing. <laughs> but, on, but on the other hand, it also shows this, there's so much headroom. Right. Yeah. Um, a reminder that there is opportunity and there is something to go for. And sometimes it feels like, what's the point? You know, sometimes when we get stuck in the news cycle, that's true. it can feel like, what's the point of anything? But there is, there is so much room to grow. There really is. There is room to grow. And it's interesting because you have, um, you know, the Middle East region is one. You have um, the rest of Asia, particularly, you know, attendees here from Indonesia, Malaysia, and so forth, see an opportunity and optimism that we're not currently feeling in most of Europe, which is a real change of tone. Um, and it's unfortunate because you want to, to find Europe, you know, invigorated, not militaristically, which we're seeing some of but really invigorating and seeing, okay, what are the opportunities and so forth. Um, but longer term, all the points you raised about, you know, GDP growth, how are you seizing and capitalizing on the, the potential of your people, be it governments thinking of their populations or CEOs and business leaders here looking at how can they best get the best out of their teams, um, but also adjust. There's, there's a real sense of adjustments post-pandemic. Well, it's been great talking to you here, Mina, and hopefully we'll be back either in January or May next year. We don't know yet, but I'm sure they'll tell us before the week is out. They'll want to get on everyone's diaries soon. Exactly. Mina al -Arabi, the National's Editor-in-Chief. And thank you all for joining us. See you next time.